All right, testing, testing one, two, testing one, two, three. We are live. Good. All right, greetings, greetings, travelers. How are you all doing out there? Hope you are doing well today. It is... Oh, what is this, Wednesday? It's Wednesday. <sighs> a little bit, little bit of water there. Get all of this uh, ready to go. As always, we are broadcasting live from our studio using our virtual planetarium software, which you see right here. We're going to bounce around between a couple of different things. This is our virtual planetarium software. This is Stellarium.org. Go to that website and you will get this. This is Stellarium. This is actually the software that we're talking about. Put that right there. So you can see you can pick anywhere on the planet. See the sky wherever you happen to live. Very, very cool. We're also going to be using something called Universe Sandbox, which is a game you can find over on Steam. Looks a little something like this. Now we've got it doing a virtual solar system, so we'll leave this playing kind of in the background. We'll slow it down a little bit. We'll bounce back and forth between all of them as we go along. We're also going to be using our web browser. We're using the Valdi web browser today. And we're going to start off with uh, what we always start off with, which is astronomy picture of the day. Normally it looks like this. It's just a list of URLs, and as soon as you click on one, it will take you in and look at image or a video or whatever it happens to be that particular day. I'll probably come back to this in a little bit, because uh, we'll talk about Saturn in just a few minutes. Today is the 15th, and so this is today's starting picture of the day. Uh, this one is actually weather related. Uh, we do talk about weather on this channel every now and again. As you can see here, this is a cyclone path, and of course, in this case, a cyclone is a hurricane or a typhoon, depending on which side of the planet you happen to be on. Somewhere in here would be Japan <laughs> and uh, Taiwan. You can see part of the Korean peninsula up here. Uh, this obviously is the western side of the planet. Eastern side of the planet. There's Australia, and you see stuff. The Indian Ocean. There we go. See things coming in onto the west coast of the United States. And, of course, as we keep going further east, you find uh, coming off of Africa. That's where we get most of the major cyclones that hit the eastern side of the United States. And, of course, the Caribbean down here. So, very cool. Not too astronomy related in this case. Okay. If you don't know what you're looking at, there's a way to description right down here. You can also click on different things. You'll notice that they have a starting picture of the day on Instagram in multiple languages. So you can click on that and get a new photo on your Instagram every day. Pretty helpful. It does go back to 1995. The pictures obviously are a lot smaller back then. Less quality, but some web browsers are a little wonky, so sometimes you gotta click this full APOD archive over there to go all the way back to web 1.0. Oh, we'll be using that a little bit later. That's not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about this. Unpack this. Dang it. Fine, I'll move this. There's nest if you if you've never used a Vivaldi before, don't don't screw up like I just did. There's actually nested tabs which are really helpful. 
Just not right now. And of course, I got rid of the tab I didn't want to get rid of. <sighs> Wonderful. What I was hoping to show all of you. Hey, how are you? Welcome, welcome to the stream. It's always chat as you need to chat. Grab a snack, grab something to drink. This is, of course, our one o'clock astronomy stream. I, start, I might actually start streaming at night as well. See if I can get a different audience to uh, stop on by. Nonetheless, uh, this is actually the big news over the last few hours. Actually, eight hours ago, this was reported. Uh, looks like something got too close to Jupiter and pulled in by its gravitational field and actually smacked the planet. That's kind of an important thing. Jupiter kind of acts like a vacuum cleaner. You'll see some flashes happening up here. This is through some amateur astronomer from Brazil. His name I'll stay in just a second when I zoom back out of this. But you see repeatedly on the right-hand side of the planet, some sort of impact, big bright flash of light. This happens more often than you would think. Most of the time we're just not watching. So, good for this astronomy, good lucky, lucky view to capture this. Now, a few years ago, Jupiter did get impacted by something. It was the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And, uh... That looked vastly different. That was something that was actually projected to happen. Something that we knew was coming, so to speak. We actually got to watch Comet break up into pieces. Let me see if I can get a picture for you. Let's throw that up here over on the still store. There we go. Woo! Yeah. So this used to be a comet, and it was split into pieces when Shoemaker Levy 9 broke apart. But uh, this is not what happened this time. Now, it could have been a small comet that maybe we didn't know about. Could have been just an asteroid, which is most likely what happened. Either way, lots of things can actually break apart and impact the planet. But we're pretty lucky, because, uh, you know, Jupiter's a lot bigger than we are. They can take big hits like that. In fact, here's a... Here's a video showing some of these impacts. You see the planet Jupiter over here and these huge scar marks. This was, again, from 1994. This was the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet impact. Um, again, the comet broke up into a big string of uh, fragments, and it actually impacted the upper atmosphere of the planet, leaving these huge scars. They were bigger than our planet. And so for an amateur astronomer to just happen to be looking at the planet Jupiter and see something impact its upper atmosphere... One that's really incredible. Again, lucky him. I actually didn't mention his name, did I? Now, let's see here. I know it's mentioned somewhere up here. Brazilian observer Luis. Jose Luis Pereira. Good on you, buddy. Amateur astronomer discovering something hitting the planet Jupiter overnight. So, uh, that's pretty cool. Oh, we got a follow. Gerald Kibler. Cheryl Kibler, hello. Welcome, welcome to the stream. Talking about uh, this. This is actually kind of an important thing that happened last night. We're still trying to catch up and figure out what in the world it actually was. Again, it likely was an asteroid impact on the planet Jupiter. Maybe you guys are watching on Facebook. Again, we've got multi-stream going on, so I'm not sure where all of you are. If you're on Facebook, go ahead and just type in the chat. There should be a chat available. Uh, if you're on Twitch, feel free to type in chat. If you're on YouTube, some of you are out there, feel free to type in chat, ask questions, and we'll try to answer them as best we can. We haven't missed too much. We did talk about Astronomy Picture of the Day, which days isn't really astronomy-based. It's mostly weather-based, which is kind of cool anyway. And uh, then we jumped on to talking about Jupiter again, getting hit by something we don't know what, likely an asteroid, maybe a small comet that hadn't started giving off gas, we're not sure yet. But uh, super exciting to have something like that happen literally overnight. So 
Oh, I figured I had to come on. Again, this is actually what Shoemaker Levy 9 looked like uh, back in 1994. That's what we just saw a video of. But uh, yeah, let's actually talk about the night sky. That's what we're here for. At least that's what I'm here for. I'm not sure what all of you are here for. Again, feel free to stop me, ask questions whenever you'd like in order to facilitate you learning something new. We are currently looking at the nighttime, uh, the daytime sky, the current sky outside the way it is right now. It's sunny, at least where I am. If you're on the other side of the world, maybe this will look a little different for you. Uh, you just got to tell me where you're at and we'll try to adjust things and make things look a little bit better. At least more like what you would see in your sky. Also, if you have any issues with my volume or background noise, they do have a fan on in here. Uh, just let me know and I'll make some adjustments to the setup so that you don't hear any background noises. We're going to go ahead and fast forward time now. Time is a terrible thing to waste and frankly, life is too short. You don't want to waste too much time. But what we are going to do is make time go faster in our planetarium because we need to get to nighttime now. The sun is out during the daytime, hence the daytime. The sun is a ball of gas and plasma. Its light travels 93 million miles. That's 150 million kilometers, give or take, to get to the Earth. That process takes oh, about eight, eight minutes, a little bit more than eight minutes to get here. When it gets the planet Earth, the light filters through our atmosphere. During the daytime, the shorter wavelengths, the blues, indigos, and violets, so think of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, the blues, indigos, and violets, those are the ones that filter through and make our atmosphere look a nice bright blue. During the evenings, or during the extreme mornings, when the sun is coming up or when the sun is setting, uh, the oranges and the yellows and the reds filter through. So you get the beautiful sunrise and sunset that we're used to. Let's go ahead and set this down. All right, here we are. We are looking at the night sky now. I'm going to back it up. This is the entire nighttime sky tonight, facing south, actually with our head tilted all the way up. There's so many things to talk about. We're going to talk about some constellations. We're going to talk about planets. We're going to talk about the zodiac constellations and why they are the way they are. At least the western zodiac constellations. Again, just stop me at any point. Type in chat what you want to ask a question of. Unlike a real planetarium, where, you know, in planetariums we can't see people raising their hands. Here we can. So we're doing this virtually on your cell phone or on your computer or on your tablet. Whatever you happen to be watching on, we appreciate you tuning in. So, where shall we begin? Well, first, let's talk about constellations. <clears throat> it's good. We're live, so of course that might happen. Sorry about that. Let's let the sun set. We are going to talk about constellations really fast. There are 88 constellations overall in the nighttime sky, combining the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Now, the sky is different. If you live below the equator, if you live in Australia, if you live in any part of Africa, if you live in certain parts of India, Anywhere south, South America, uh, Brazil, I don't know, Venezuela, uh, Chile, Argentina, anywhere south of the equator, uh, your sky will look different than it is up here in the Northern Hemisphere. Some constellations are visible in both, so anything along, it, since we're in the Northern Hemisphere up here, anything way down here, so Scorpius, Sagittarius, uh, many zodiac constellations are visible in both hemispheres, uh, but there are some constellations that are not visible up here from the northern point of view, and there are some constellations I might talk about that you may not see where you live, because you're in the southern hemisphere, so let's just get that out of the way. Uh, there's 88 constellations overall. Some of them are beasts, some of them are heroes, some of them are hybrids like Capricorn, which is half goat, half fish. Many of them come from ancient, ancient peoples. We're talking Babylon. We're talking Egypt. Long, long ago. 
drink it all in. Of course, we don't see the sky like that. We see the sky more like this. And this is if you're out in the middle of nowhere. If you're in a big city, you may not have a good, clear view of the sky. Uh, that is an effect called light pollution. Here we are now in a very light polluted area. You can see a lot of the constellations are gone. Only the main bright stars and planets remain. So you really want to get outside of town if you possibly can. Uh, in order to see the sky the way it's truly meant to be seen. For some, it's just going outside town five, ten minutes. For some, if you're in a big, big uh, city, you do have to get really far away from the what's called the light dome to be able to see the faintness of the Milky Way in the sky and to see the dimmest of stars. You can see about 3,000 stars, give or take, uh, depending on the quality of your eyes, I guess is the best way of saying it. The quality of the sky. Now, tonight, there's going to be a bunch of planets out. We're going to start with the planets. Uh, the word planet actually comes from Greek, believe it or not. Uh, Planetus Asteris, uh, Wandering Star, is the name. The Greeks considered seven objects in the sky to be what we now call the classical planets. Now, two of them aren't planets at all. Let me explain. The Greeks looked at the sky and they considered the sun and the moon to be planets. They were wandering stars. They were bright objects to them moving through the sky. So the moon, the sun, it's two of them. And then you have the planet Mercury, the planet Venus, the planet Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are what we call them today. That's not what they called them. They have different deities they were named after. But that's what we call them today. So that's a total of seven objects. The sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Those seven objects have seven days of the week named after them. This is how calendars were built. The cycle of the moon orbiting around the Earth, going through its phases. That is what we call a month. That is a 29-day period, 29 and a half day period, a little bit longer than that. Uh, that's how you get a month. And then the location of the sun. The location of the sun, the sun happens to travel through 12 constellations in the sky. And we call them the Zodiac. Name a couple. There's Virgo off to the right. Libra, the scales. Can uh, Scorpius, I should say. Sagittarius. Capricorn. Aquarius. Pisces. These are the locations the sun is in the sky if you use the stars as a map. So this is how you build a calendar. You count the cycles of the moon. You count the locate. You watch the location of the sun and watch as it proceeds through the sky between each of these constellations, these 12 zodiac constellations. And then you notice that the planets all happen to travel along the same exact path. They're not exactly on the same line. They're really close. Now, calendars were built long ago. That's what we use today. Why do I still have names up? Let's get rid of that. Starting from the western horizon, you might get to see the planet Mercury again. This depends on whether you got buildings or hills in the way. We are looking towards the west. The sun has just set. The planet Mercury is right along the horizon. Just up off the edge. We'll look at Mercury up close in a little bit. You should be able to draw a line between the planet Mercury and the planet Venus. Venus will be very, very bright up here in the sky, in the western sky. It's almost as high as it can be uh, in the nighttime sky. Some people call it the morning star. Some people call it the evening star. It's not a star at all. It is a planet. Second planet of our solar system. Mercury is the closest of the sun. Uh, Venus is the second closest of the sun. Between the two, you'll see a bright star. This is the alpha star of the constellation Virgo, known as Spica. There we go. So you'll draw a line between these three objects right along the western horizon. Spica will be a bright bluish white and will twinkle. Mercury and Venus will not twinkle. I will actually admit Mercury might twinkle slightly just because it's so close to the horizon. But the good adage is stars twinkle, planets don't. So planets, for the most part, do not twinkle. When it comes to planets or when it comes to objects in the sky, the brightest thing you can see in the sky is the sun. The second brightest thing you can see in the sky is the moon, which happens to be out tonight. Look at that in just a second. The third brightest object you can see at night is the planet Venus, which again is out in the western sky tonight. Don't miss out on that. Gonna rotate our head a little bit and look towards the south. 
The fourth brightest object in the sky is the planet Jupiter, which also is out tonight. Uh, Saturn is also out tonight. So of the planets you can see without a uh, telescope, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn are all out tonight after sunset. Mars is just not in a good place for us to see it, and I'll explain why in just a second. Let's look at the moon, and then we'll look at the two planets we just talked about, and we'll look at the solar system. How's that sound? Good? All right, let's do it. All right, so the moon has been proceeding through the sky, proceeding through the sky, processing, proceeding, processing, processing, processing is the word we're looking for. Both, yeah, both, we'll go with both. Uh, earlier in the week, the moon was over here, it was actually right above Venus just a few evenings ago, and it has been trailing from west to east to the position it is in now. A few nights ago, it was above Antares, the heart of Scorpio. Right now, it's residing within the constellation Sagittarius in the southern part of the sky. We are approaching a full moon. Just a few evenings from now, we'll get a full moon. Right now, the moon looks something like this. The moon is in a waxing gibbous phase. Waxing is when you have the bright side on the right side of the moon. Waning is when the bright side's on the left side. Do be aware, when you look through a telescope, this image will actually invert itself and flip over. So you'll actually have the bright side on the left side of a telescope, because we were looking at the moon last night, and that was exactly the pictures we got, where the moon flipped over. Uh, here you see the Dark Mare, the seas of the moon. These are ancient lava beds that are now filled up and solidified into solid rocks. As far as we know, the moon is a solid rock with no uh, real magma going on. Magma, you know, liquid lava stuff going on under its surface. There are moon quakes on occasion on the moon. The assumption is that that has something to do with the gravity of the planet Earth. This is a tidally locked moon, which means it is always looking towards us with this exact same face. If you have a telescope or a good set of binoculars, always look right along the edge of this right here, the Terminator. You'll actually, the Terminator. You will actually see really, really cool relief of the craters, these splotches you see here and here and here, those are craters, those are impacts on the surface of the moon. And since the moon has no atmosphere, nothing changes, there's no, there's no weathering, there's nothing that will get rid of the surface of the moon the way we see it. It's been like that for generations and generations. The only times it changes is when something lands on the moon, like we did in the 60s. Uh, or when asteroids impact the moon, which occasionally happens, you get little micrometeoroids uh, hitting the surface. We'll look at the moon in just a sec. We'll also talk about phases in just a sec. Let's get uh, through the last two planets here. Uh, you'll see Saturn and Jupiter from right to left. We'll talk about Jupiter first, because uh, obviously we already started talking about Jupiter. Uh, the impact, obviously, is not in this, but there was an impact, as we talked about just a few minutes ago, on the planet Jupiter, on its upper atmosphere. Uh, when you look at Jupiter through a telescope, you see something like this. You see Io, you see Europa, you see Ganymede and Callisto. These are the Galilean moons, named for Galileo Galilei. Uh, 1610 is the year that he discovered these little objects orbiting around Jupiter. Now, they're not exactly as small as you would think. The, the moon Ganymede, right out here, that is actually slightly bigger than Mercury. So if it wasn't orbiting around Jupiter, it would be a planet in its own right, orbiting the sun. Io is a volcanic moon. Can we zoom in on Io enough? Maybe. Eh, it doesn't look too good, but that's okay. Uh, Io is a volcanic moon. As you see, it's got lots of weird coloring due to the sulfur and other materials blowing it onto its surface. It's too close to Jupiter. Jupiter's gravity is slowly pulling it apart and uh, causing volcanic activity. Europa, you don't see too well here, but uh, we'll see if we can look at Europa in 3D in just a little bit. Uh, Europa is an ice moon that is a probable candidate to search for life in our solar system. Under its icy crust, there's a fairly sizable saltwater ocean believed to be under that crust. Uh, Ganymede and Callisto may also have icy water under its surface. Both surfaces are ice crusts. If you look at Jupiter tonight at 8, 10 p.m., you'll see the great red spot hanging off the edge right over here. 
And of course, the dark club bends. These are club bends that go in different directions. And actually, it's kind of important. This actually goes back to what we talked about earlier. When you look at the map of the Earth, let's see, can we do that real fast? When you look at the map of the Earth, where is my map of the Earth? Where is it? There we go. When you look at the map of the Earth and you look at the cyclone paths, where do you notice? Right along the equator, right? Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, as they're called. The equator would be right along here. And you see these storm paths, they're all really, really close to the equator. Well, let's go back to Stellarium. Let's take a look at Jupiter once again. Where do you notice those cloud bands? There's a lot more of them, but you're going to notice a lot of storm activity along the equator, just above and just below it. It's where the Great Red Spot is. Great Red Spot has also been around since... Well, time immemorial, as long as we know. Uh, it was first discovered in 1610 with the Galilean moons by Galileo, and it's still raging on. It's a big storm, bigger than our entire planet Earth. Zooming in on, Ju on Saturn, leaving Jupiter, going over to Saturn, we see this. If you look at Saturn through a telescope, you will see initially what looks like ears. It's an object with ears. And as you zoom in more and more and more, you start to get more resolution those ears become these rings. Uh, Saturn has a huge moon named Titan. It looks like this, and it does look very pale because it actually has an atmosphere. It's the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. So you don't actually see the surface of Titan when you look at it. You're looking at the clouds around it uh, made of methane. Here we see Saturn up close. Such a beautiful planet to see. Uh, it is not the only planet with rings. It just happens to be the only planet with rings that are reflecting back a lot of sunlight that we can actually see. Saturn's rings made of ices, uh, fairly young ices, so likely a comet or multiple comets or maybe a large ice moon that got too close and ripped apart and destroyed and eventually flattened out into this ring system. The dark ring you see is actually a ring called the Cassini Division. It's an empty-ish ring right along in here. It's also what's called the Enki Gap right out here for two scientists that discovered them. Uh, we've also got Enceladus. Enceladus, much like... Oh, you can't even zoom in anymore, can you? That's okay. Much like Europa, Enceladus is another candidate for life. Enceladus, oddly enough, is close enough to Saturn to have gravitational influences on it, uh, warming up under its surface, so it's got some sort of watery ocean under its crust. And on top of that, it's got geysers spewing water out into space it's really cool let's back out of all this so those are the planets you can see tonight again all you gotta do is go outside uh mercury's already gone from the sky so mercury's only going to be up in the sky for about 20 30 minutes give or take i think 40 is the tops venus in the sky for about an hour and a half or so after sunset uh jupiter and saturn they're out most of the night the moon as well. And the moon, of course, does move relative to the sky a lot faster because it's closer than anything else you're looking at. So let's talk about the moon. Let's look at the moon's phases. As the moon goes around our planet, it goes through what are called phases. So we need to get to the right screen. We need to get to the right screen. Uh, where is it? Eh, it's gone. Okay, cool. There we go. Much better. All right. So let's let's get all of this in the right way. So we're looking at the Earth right here. I'm looking at the Earth from the top. So there's the North Pole. You see the moon orbiting around us. And we got sunlight represented by these weird looking arrows. They look almost like Star Destroyers from Star Wars. Just ignore that. You'll notice the moon has gone one quarter of the way around our planet. And so it's gone through what's called the first quarter moon phase. As the moon continues to go around our planet, it reflects more and more sunlight back towards us. It does not generate its own light, it's just reflecting back sunlight. Here we see what is called full moon phase, so the moon is directly behind us, so the sun is to the right, the moon to the left, and the earth right in the middle. 
That's a full moon, so it's gone halfway around the planet Earth, and now the cycle reverses. So we go from waxing into what's called waning moon. Waning moon starts rising up later and later and later and starting to look dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as it's reflecting back less sunlight towards us. The same face again, still looking towards us this entire time. Three quarters of the way around our planet, we now hit third quarter phase right here right side on the left side you start to see this around one or two in the morning maybe three in the morning getting later and later and later rising later and later or i guess earlier and earlier is the better phrase and then we get here we get to new moon phase where the moon is between us and the sun so all the lights bouncing off the back side so it's not really a dark side is it it's the back side of the moon That's when the moon and the sun are in the sky at the same time for a few days. And then the cycle begins again. We start to see a crescent moon appearing in our evening sky to start a new month. Now, the calendar month and the cycle of the moon don't always line up. So sometimes you start off a month in a different phase. Sometimes you start off a month with a full moon. Sometimes you start off a month with a third quarter moon. Sometimes you start off with the first quarter. It just depends. Uh, unfortunately, the, the modern 365-day calendar doesn't line up uh, with the way a lunar solar calendar would. It's okay. Uh, other things to talk about, once again, uh, are eclipses. They, uh, they can happen. An eclipse is when the moon uh, covers up the sun. That's a solar eclipse. Those are not safe to view without proper filters. Uh, when the moon is in new moon phase, it can cover up the sun. When the moon is behind the Earth, it can line up on occasion with the Earth's shadow and actually go into what's called a lunar eclipse. Those are totally safe to view, and, you know, the moon can turn into a blood red color sometimes, uh, depending on which portion of the Earth's shadow uh, it happens to be hiding in. Very, very cool. Let's take a look at the Earth-Moon system up close. We'll look at the whole solar system in just a second. This is the wrong software. Again, feel free to stop me, ask questions as we go along. If I don't directly respond to chat, that's okay, because I'll try to weave in what your question is uh, into what I am talking about. Make it easier. So here we are, just looking at the Earth and the Moon. There's the Earth. Uh, remember I talked about light pollution. This is what we're talking about. This is the Earth at night. Australia, not too much light pollution in the middle, but along the edges where the major cities are. Here again, you see... Lots of light pollution in Europe. Here comes the eastern seaboard of the United States. You want to be where it's darkest, so honestly, out in the ocean is the best place to be. Because there's no light. Australia, once again, we'll look at the southern hemisphere. There's southern Africa. South America. Amazon, obviously a good place to look at if you can actually get away from the trees long enough to see the sky. Uh, meanwhile, the moon. As you zoom back out, you can kind of see uh, the relative size and distance to the moon. Here we go. There is our lunar companion. And again, the seas, the dark areas. People thought they were filled with water. They are not. Uh, you do have large impact craters on those seas, so that means that these impact craters are younger. You can actually see the rays of material being thrown out from the impacts themselves. So again, if you have a small telescope or even just a good set of binoculars, let's look at the moon. You should be able to see some of these dust rays shooting out from these impact craters. Now, the back side of the moon, well, very few people have ever actually seen. Because you got to be in an orbiter, go around the moon to actually get to the back side. So let's actually orbit around the moon real fast. See a huge impact crater with a little bit of lava, a little bit of mare, as we call it. This is the back side of the moon. This is during new moon phase. And so... The new moon means the backside's getting all the sunlight, and there you go. There's the backside of the moon. This side of the moon's a little bit thicker than the other side. Uh, again, it's tidally locked, so the side facing the Earth has actually been thinned out over time by the Earth's gravity. Can I get rid of that thing? There we go. Much better. I 
again, you can see a couple of huge impact craters. I do have some lava that flowed out, but the majority, not much Mari on this side, but a huge amount of cratering, uh, which is good for us. That means the moon is kind of like our shield, protects us from large impacts of asteroids hitting the planet Earth. What is an asteroid? Well, let's talk about that because we're going to look at the whole solar system. Let's zoom back out and zoom into our solar system. Let's slow this down. Here we go. Now, the structure of our solar system. Remember, I said the sun appears to travel through 12 constellations. We call them the zodiac. And the planets and the moon appear to travel along that same exact line. We call the zodiac or the planet of the ecliptic. If you look at our solar system from far enough away, you'll notice... A majority of the objects happen to be on that flattened out plane. Draw the equator of the sun out as far as you can, and you'd see the major planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all happen to be along that plane. The outliers, the really strange ones you see way out here, these are where the comets usually come from. Uh, there's actually a, what's called the Kuiper Belt. There's even even further area out here called the Oort Cloud, where comets also come from. But everything out here is really, really frozen. Pluto is one of these oddballs. It has a very off-kilter, uh, off-axis orbit. That's what these are. That's what these lines are. As we zoom in, we'll see the first four planets of our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We call them terrestrial. Terra meaning Earth-like planets. Something like this. Zoom in all the way real fast. We'll see the sun. Ah, it's super bright. Notice the sun has convection zones. It's actually areas where stuff is bubbling up from the inside of the sun, giving off energy, and then they cool off and go back. You actually see convection cells all along it. If there's an area where the magnetic field of the sun gets a little twisted up, uh, you'll actually get a cold spot, what is called a sunspot, appearing on its surface. Not in this simulation, but we can talk about sunspots when we get more and more active sunspot activity, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks and months. Here we are looking at the planet Mercury. As you see, it is a rock. There is no satellite orbiting around it. It doesn't have any moons. There's no atmosphere. All the impacts on its surface, they've pretty much been there since time immemorial. It rotates fairly rapidly, and it is orbiting the sun fairly close. We have not investigated Mercury very much because it's really hard to get to, uh, but it is pretty inhospitable because of the lack of atmosphere. There's not a lot of heat convection in an atmosphere there, because there is none. And so if you're on the side facing the sun, you're roast. If you're on the side facing away from the sun, you freeze. This planet, however, is very different. This is the planet Venus, second planet of the solar system. It's like Earth's evil twin. It is a little bit smaller than the Earth and has slightly less gravity, but it has a very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, which we can see here. It reflects a huge amount of sunlight back, so it's very bright in our sky. This atmosphere is so very thick, though, it traps a huge amount of sunlight, and so it is hot all the time. We're talking an inhospitable 420 degrees celsius give or take at all times whether you're on the daytime side or the nighttime side so it's just an inferno at all times the other weird thing is that this planet rotates the wrong direction the sun rises in the west and sets in the east which is opposite what the way it does here on the earth also rotates really really slowly the year on venus is actually the day on venus is about as long as it's year which is very strange, because here on the Earth, well, we rotate every 24 hours. So we have 365 rotations for one complete cycle or a year around the sun. With Venus, it only goes around once for one single day. Very strange. Mars is the next planet out in our solar system. Let's take a look at it. Let me slow it down, because it does rotate at a fairly fast clip, it rotates actually about the same speed as the Earth. It's 24 hours and 37 minutes long. It's actually a little bit faster rotation uh, because it's smaller, so it angular momentum and all that kind of stuff. With Mars, you have a huge crack in the surface. This is Valles Marineris. Valles Marineris. Uh, 
It's about nine kilometers deep. It would stretch across the entire United States. Then you've got, let's pause it here real fast. You've got the Tharsis Montes, these three shield volcanoes, and then Olympus Mons. If you look at the map of the United States in the southwest corner of the states, you will notice Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. Pick a state, this volcano is bigger than it. You could fit New Mexico, you could fit Utah, you could fit Arizona, or you could fit Colorado in this volcano or the other way around. This thing is huge. You can actually even see from this that it is actually sticking up ever so slightly from the surface of the planet before you start your climb. Uh, it's actually sticking up above the atmosphere. So you don't want to be on the surface without a spacesuit in general, but you don't want to be on the tip of this uh, without a spacesuit, most definitely. There are two asteroid-style moons orbiting around the planet Mars, there's Phobos, meaning fear, and Deimos, meaning panic. Um, uh, Phobos is actually in a decaying orbit. You'll notice it's pretty close to Mars. But it's actually a little bit too close to Mars, and eventually it will crash into the planet. Uh, that'll be a big bada boom. Not a good thing. Those two are captured asteroids, which is what we're going to talk about next. You see out here, there's a couple of little splotches. We can kind of just zoom in on a bunch of them. Uh, these are what we call asteroids. They are sometimes rocks that look like this, where they're oblongly shaped. Uh, other ones maybe are more spherical. Let's look at Juno, which is an asteroid. There we go. You can see it's, you know, spherical spherical in nature they come in different shapes they come in different sizes they are kind of leftover material that may have been enough for a very small planetoid or they're just leftover chunks of rock early on everything was not as orderly as this and so things were floating around crashing into each other and ejecting material out into space uh, so we got leftover material making the asteroid belt in between the planet Mars and the next stop, which is Jupiter. So, what could have hit Jupiter was an asteroid that maybe flung itself out a little bit too far from the asteroid belt, or it came from even further out, out here, and zoomed in, and got hit by the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is gigantic, and it rotates very fast. A day on Jupiter is only about eight and a half hours. It's a little bit less than that, but we're just going to go with 8.5 because it's an easy to remember number. Jupiter does have satellites around it, moons as we call them. We talked about four of them. But as you can see, there's a huge family around Jupiter. Huge amount of gravity with this planet. It does have a ring system, but you can only really see it if you're behind the planet. And it's really, really thin. Hello, welcome to chat. Welcome to our stream. We're just kind of doing a virtual tour of the solar system at the moment. And uh, we're kind of following up on what we think happened to Jupiter last night. Jupiter got hit by something. We don't know what, likely an asteroid uh, from the asteroid belt. So as we zoom out, you keep an eye on Jupiter here in the middle. The asteroid belt is right in here. An asteroid may have gotten a little too far out of its lane, pulled into Jupiter, and then went kaboom. And uh, yeah, that's what we're talking about right now. If you have questions, once again, just post them in chat, and we'll try to answer them as we talk about the various objects, and then uh, we'll go back to our planetarium software and look at some constellations and do some visual astronomy so you can find your way around the sky. There, once again, is the Great Red Spot. Let's see, can we zoom in on Io and Europa and all them, or are we kind of luck here? Uh, there's Io, which I talked about earlier. There's the volcanic moon. Europa is really the one I wanted to talk about, though, because Europa is really pretty. It's also got these weird cracks along its surface. There we go. It's got weird cracks along the surface. It's very thick ice, and like 10, 15 kilometers thick. But again, under the surface of this moon, there's likely an ocean of salt water. And if there's salt water, could there be life? There are extremophiles here on the Earth that live in extreme cold and extreme hot temperatures. You know, if there's geysers or anything like that under the surface. You know, what's going on in, on Europa? We don't know. Hopefully one day we'll have some sort of orbiter or a lander. We got the moons on there. I want to get rid of the moons if possible. Guess not. All right. Well, whatever. 
Uh, let's go to Saturn. That's the next object. Now, please excuse Saturn. Saturn looks really weird at first because it doesn't have its rings. We have to artificially add them in here. There we go. There's the rings of Saturn. See why we have to artificially add these in, because they're not just solid rings. They are individual particles that have to be rendered on in here. There we go. Saturn is a huge family. I believe there's 82 objects officially orbiting around the planet Saturn. You can see huge family around it. There we go. At least we can do 3D fly around, right? Uh, we did talk about Enceladus when we were inside. You can see these is, this is the way these, these moons orbit around the planet. That's why you get these little trails, because time is moving along. This is Enceladus, and again, there are geysers under this surface shooting out through these cracks. Actual water being blown out onto the surface. What a strange little moon. Another prime candidate for life potentially being in our solar system. Let's get rid of those moons and try to save some virtual memory. Slow things down. Let's look at the outer planets now. Uranus is an oddball. Some people call it Uranus, some men call it Uranus. This is the way it's supposed to be pronounced. I'm going to add in the moons and add in the ring system. Uranus and Saturn have distinct ring systems. Neptune does as well, but uh, they're just not very obvious. Now, Interestingly, as you see, let's add in Uranus rings. As we orbit along here, everything kind of makes this weird spiral. But it's even more pronounced and weird here, isn't it? Uranus is on its side. The ring system is here. In fact, can I get the North Pole? marker there we go the planet's on its side the north pole is over here south pole is back there why we don't know this entire system the rings the moons all of it they're all on their sides and we don't know why titania the largest moon around this planet very very strange It's also the outermost, actually Oberon, I think, is the outermost of these moons. So here's where we get into this issue of, are these naturally formed with the planets? Actually, there's a bunch more out here, but they're a lot smaller. Were they formed with the planet? Were they formed elsewhere and captured? That's always the question. That is an obvious question with Neptune. Because Neptune is out at the edge of the solar system, much like Mars, it may have captured some things. And the obvious one is going to be Triton. If you watch, you see all of these moons are orbiting in one direction, except for Triton. Triton's heading in this direction. So if these are all counterclockwise, magically Triton's going in a clockwise direction. Why? We don't know. Why did it go back? I don't know. That's not what I wanted. Again, different colors, different elements on the surfaces, lots of ices. We're really far out. We're really far away. Now, Neptune, of course, named for the god of the sea. Poseidon in Greek has a bright bluish tinge to it. Very, very cold. This is our solar system. This is the family in which our planet Earth is just one of many objects orbiting around the sun. Let's go back to our other view so let's get rid of this for now or i can screw it up and reload it that's that's cool too let's get rid of everything so save some memory there go back to our planetarium so that is 
an overview of the solar system. That is the reason why the planets appear on this flattened out plane. That is why the zodiac constellations are so important. Let's actually talk about some constellations so you can go out tonight and be confident in what you're looking at. Obvious in the southern sky is a J of stars. This J is one of the easiest constellations to find. It is a constellation that looks much like a scorpion. Various cultures on this planet saw it as a scorpion or scorpion's tail. Behind that is Sagittarius, which looks kind of like a teapot. Right in here, three stars. Look for easy to find shapes. So you look, oh gosh, you're looking for triangles, you're looking for squares. Uh, Sagittarius has two distinct triangles that are really easy to find. You'll notice it's pointing towards Antares. This is the heart of the scorpion right over here. Antares literally meaning anti-Aries or anti-Mars. Very red in color. But... It is not the planet Mars. Please hydrate yourself if you haven't done so already. Interestingly is between the two of these is the heart of our galaxy. Now, our galaxy is the Milky Way. All the stars you see at night are part of this galaxy, but there are many objects that are not part of the galaxy that are out there. You can actually see other galaxies as well. And within our own galaxy, you see lots of little star clusters. You do need a telescope to be able to see a good majority of these objects. We'll talk about a couple of them here in just a little bit. Sorry, had to do a little moderation there. Couple of things in chat that were a little wonky that I had to take care of. Sorry about that. Let's get rid of the deep sky stuff and find some more constellations. Well, it's actually not a constellation, but a asterism, but we'll do that. Tonight, if you look straight up, literally straight up, you will see a triangle of bright blue stars. They're actually in three different constellations. Vega is the most towards the west. Deneb is the most towards the east. Altair is the one that's most towards the south. Now, this is a grouping of stars called the Summer Triangle. Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And since we're now approaching fall, fall should be starting here with the equinox in just a few evenings, uh, you're going to notice that these stars are going to be getting lower and lower and lower, signifying the end of the summer uh, also means the harvest season is upon us. Each one is in a different constellation. Vega is in the constellation Lyra the Harp. Deneb is the tail of Cygnus the Swan. Altair is the heart of... Actually, it's the beak of. Depends on how you draw it. Some people have it as the beak. Some people have it as the heart of Aquila the Eagle. Now, if you can draw this triangle out, Draw a line towards the middle. In fact, just follow Deneb along the body of Cygnus the Swan. It's also called the Great Northern Cross in the sky. The tip of the beak of the swan is right smack dab in the middle of the triangle. If you have a set of binoculars or a small telescope, you can look at what is called Albirio. That's the name of the star. But interestingly enough, when you zoom in, you actually see two stars. Stars come in binary or sometimes trinary systems, so that means that there's two stars or three stars orbiting around each other. This is considered to be what's called an optical binary. And what that means is that it just happens to be two stars close to each other from our point of view. That means they're not actually close to each other at all. They're not orbiting each other. We're not really sure. Some people are still kind of trying to figure it out, um, doing the math, watching them as we orbit around the sun. Uh, seeing how they wobble to see if they make each other wobble to see if they're gravitationally bound to each other. So again, right smack dab in the middle of the triangle, you will find that. Another object that's actually kind of interesting in this part of the sky is located over here in the constellation Lyra the Harp. Can't click it directly, but I know where it is. There it is. So if you look at Vega... You will notice, hey, there's a little satellite going by. Look at that. Doot, 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 keeping its way by. Vega, there's four stars, part of Lyra the Harp, total of five. 
It's like you draw them out. If you can connect these last two stars, literally just stop right in the middle of them. And you will notice that there is this little fuzzball. Through a telescope, it literally looks like a little fuzzball. Actually looks like a ghostly eyeball. This is the Ring Nebula, and this is the result of a star that has died. Uh, stars go through their life cycles, uh, fusing hydrogen into helium, helium into lithium, carbon, oxygen, heavier and heavier elements. Uh, stars like our sun, when they approach the end of their lifetime, they kind of puff up a little bit. They come what's called a red, become what's called a red giant star. That means they cool off. Red stars are colder than yellow stars. Our sun is a yellow main sequence star. Red stars are colder. Most of the time they're smaller. There are some exceptions. They call them the red giant stars. That's a star that's puffed up and is in its dying ages. Uh, there's also hotter stars in the sun, so looking for the blues and the bright white stars. Uh, when a star dies like the sun, it leaves behind a circular, what's called a planetary nebula, something like this. Which again, you can see tonight in the sky, directly above your heads. Uh, when a star dies in a violent manner, you leave behind what's called a supernova remnant. And uh, that's a ex huge explosion in space. Never a good thing. Let's see. Uh, it's pretty to look at, though. Never a good thing if you live around it, though. What else can we find? Straight down from... We're going we're gonna to do some, some trickery here. Straight from Vega. Draw a line straight down. You'll see a star named Arcturus. Now, there's a better way of finding Arcturus. Arcturus is in a constellation called Boetes or Boeades. Oh, God. Come on. There we go. There's Boeades. There he is. Down here. I'll show you how to find Arcturus in a much more efficient manner, but if you're able to draw a line between Vega and Arcturus, you'll actually draw a line through this guy right here. This is Perseus, and he's even got the head of Medusa, usually in his hand or wrapped around him. Bet if you draw that line, come on, efficiently, draw it just like that, you'll see it goes right in the middle. It bisects these four stars that make up the body of... Perseus. Just off of this right-hand star, you will see a grouping of stars that is called a globular cluster. And it looks something like this. This is the great star cluster in Hercules, or the Hercules cluster. These are older stars. Now, globular clusters tend to be thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of stars, all floating around in a big blob. They're all gravitationally bound to each other. And they tend to be older. You see, there are some blue stars here, but they tend to be older. You see a lot more red stars in the image. But I want you to understand in three dimensions where these stars live. This is the Milky Way right here. These stars are above the Milky Way in three dimensions. Think of the Milky Way like a pizza. Pizza's nice and flat. This Milky Way galaxy that we happen to be in is a flat spiral galaxy. It is a little bit thick, extra thick. And above or below it, you will find globular clusters. Clusters of, ga of stars above or below the galaxy. There's one over there. There's the Pegasus cluster, which I'll zoom in on and you'll see it too is a globular cluster. All sorts of clusters, but again, star clusters that are globular tend to be either above or below the Milky Way. There are a couple that are actually in the Milky Way because they're transiting through it. So they travel up and down this way. They kind of orbit the core of the galaxy uh, through the top and the bottom. Looking towards the north, we've turned ourselves around. We spent all this time talking about the southern sky. Let's talk about the northern sky. In the northern sky, you find some very distinct groupings of stars. Possibly the most easily found thing, what's called the Big Dipper, is not a constellation. It's an asterism. Asterisms are either easily recognized shapes or chunks of bigger constellations. This happens to be a chunk of a bigger constellation. This is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. The stomach and tail make up this cup, this big dipper that we see in the sky. Three stars of the tail, four stars of the cup. Now, it's an efficient pointer. If you follow the tail, the arc of the tail leads you to Arcturus. Pretty helpful. Arc to Arcturus. The actual 
memory devices arc to arc tourists and spike to spica but unfortunately spica is below the horizon right now it's too late to use that trick so i'm not going to talk about it arc to arc tourists spike to spica think about that you follow the arc this way and then you spike down to bright blue star which is unfortunately below the horizon uh coming back to the dipper these two front stars here we call them the pointer stars as they point to polaris so say that with me. Point to Polaris. Polaris is the pole star, the north star, the load star. All of the stars in this general area are called circumpolar. They circle the pole. They orbit around the north star from our point of view. They don't actually orbit it. It just looks like it from our point of view. All of these stars will rise and set. Polaris will stay just about in the same place throughout the entire night. Super helpful for navigation, that's for sure. Polaris, where I live, is 35 degrees above the horizon. If you live in Canada or Alaska, the North Star will be much higher up in the sky. If you live in, I don't know, Ecuador or Puerto Rico or Florida, somewhere closer to the equator, the North Star will be much lower to the sky. In fact, it could even disappear from your sky. Uh, so do be aware of that. The North Star is the tail of the Little Dipper, which oddly enough is just the or some minor constellation. So this one is a constellation. The other one, the large dipper, is not. I didn't make the rules. I'm just talking about some of these things uh, just to kind of let you know. Looking at the dipper, we actually have a couple of objects that are really cool and easily found. You do need a telescope to see them, and a big one at that. Uh, just below the tail, about three finger widths away from this tail, just draw a line straight down, you'll find this. This is a another galaxy. This is kind of what our Milky Way would look like if you looked at it from above. This is a spiral galaxy that is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. As a companion galaxy, galaxies come in different shapes and sizes. Some of them are spirals, some of them are elliptical or lenticular, so they're rounded. Uh, there's also uh, irregular, which is kind of like a leftover jumble if something collides with another one, because yes, galaxies can collide. Uh, if you draw a line between the last two tail stars of the Dipper, stop in the middle and then go three fingers above. You will find another spiral galaxy. This happens to be the Pinwheel Galaxy. Looks something like that. Yeah. Harder to find is this next object. It's actually a trio of objects. Draw a line up from the Dipper's tail. So these two stars within Draco the Dragon, which is up here, you form this nice little triangle. On this long side of the triangle, stop about halfway. And zoom in, actually a little bit less than halfway. You zoom in and you're going to find this, what's called the Draco Trio. And it is actually three different galaxies. They're different distances away. They're not necessarily gravitationally bound to each other. This is a spiral along the edge. This is a spiral, I'm sorry, along the face. This is a spiral along the edge. And we have an elliptical galaxy right in the middle. That's the Draco Trio. So everywhere you look, all of a sudden you're seeing thousands and thousands of stars, millions of stars, billions of planets in these other galaxies far, far away. In the evening sky tonight, if you look more towards the northeast, you will find this three or W shape right in here. This is Cassiopeia, Queen Cassiopeia, super vain. She angered the nymphs and the goddesses, said she was more beautiful than any of them. They punished her by strapping her to her throne, throwing her up in the sky. And so here you see her sitting on her throne half the night. She's upside down, which is never good for your beauty standards. Notice she's got a mirror. She's again, still very vain, even though she's eternally punished. Nearby is her daughter, Andromeda, a chained maiden. Uh, she's just below Pegasus. Now, Pegasus is kind of weird because Pegasus has, well, a square in it. This is the great square of Pegasus. You see this rise up around 9 o'clock, give or take, in the eastern sky. It'll be above most of the objects. If you have any buildings or mountains in the way, it'll be above everything around 9, 9.15, hopefully. And if you find the one, two, three, four stars of the Great Square of Pegasus, stop in the northeast side of it right here. 
draw a line down to the stars. These are the stars of Andromeda. You just got to count to three. One, two, three. You end up here at Mirak, kind of a yellowish colored star. One, two, three. Stop there. Just above it, you find the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, there's a good way to pinpoint it is either, again, using this method, counting to three twice, or you can go back to Cassiopeia. You'll notice that Cassiopeia is made out of triangles. One, two, three. One, two, three. Use this last triangle here. You make a pointer out of it. You can make an arrowhead and point to the Andromeda Galaxy. That's how you can pinpoint it. But there it is. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. This is a nearby galaxy that's actually heading towards us. It's one of the few objects that's actually coming towards us. We'll explain that in just a second. Let's zoom out of here and let's actually uh, go to a different software, shall we? OK, back over here. Uh, let's talk about some of the things we talked about since we have a blank canvas. Let's look at stars really fast. Our sun is not the biggest star out there. Our sun is just an average yellow star. Here we have Wolf 359. If you're a Star Trek nerd, you know exactly why I picked this. Uh, you'll see that's a red dwarf. It is smaller and colder than the sun. Very distinct, different color. Uh, let's pick some other stars and put them up in the sky here. Let's look at Sirius. Yes, I know I called you, buddy. My dog is named Sirius. Uh, you'll see Sirius is bigger than the sun, and it is brighter and bluer. They, again, come in different sizes. Oh, goodness. Let's try to add in some more stars. Uh, Rigel, I believe, is the next one we're going to put in here. Oh, that's why you didn't want to do that. Okay. Uh, Rigel is a blue giant star, and it seems to just want to consume all this. Let's put it up there. There we go. So look at that. That's a blue star, but it's huge. By comparison, look at the sun. And again... Wolf 359 is still in this image. You just gotta zoom in on it. There it is. There's Wolf 359. There's the sun. There's Sirius. There's Rigel. Uh, and those aren't even the biggest ones. We talked about Arcturus. Arcturus is out tonight. There it is. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Proxima Centauri. We'll put in really close. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our sun. You'll see it is a small star. Look at the difference in sizes. And these aren't even the big ones. Let's get to the red giant stars. Look at that. Look at how big that is compared to our sun, which is right here. These stars are huge. These stars would take up all the space between the sun and Jupiter. When you're talking about these giant stars. Uh, let's see, where's the super giant star? There we go. So that's kind of looking at how stars are. They start off again on what's called the main sequence. They go through their life cycle and then eventually they puff up and they get huge. And they can either die quietly or they can explode violently. And I think I can simulate an explosion here by speeding things up. There we go. Stars explode in different ways. Sometimes they can collide. It's very rare. But when a star does explode, you'll get something like this, which is a what's called a supernova. So you get huge amounts of heavy elements spewed out into space. Something like this. Lots of radiation. Lots of heavy elements. Everything past iron on the periodic table. That's very, very important. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Just wanted to kind of show you what a supernova would look like. Let's look at our galaxy. So this is happening all over the place. Stars are born, stars live their lives, stars die. Some of them have planets, some of them don't. Some of them have multiple stars. All in this, the Milky Way galaxy. This is our galaxy. This is a simulation of what we think our galaxy looks like. It is a spiral galaxy with arms sticking out. And spinning around the central portion of the galaxy itself. Our sun is likely around one of the edges, around one of these outer spiral arms, as we call them. 
think about this as you go around. I mean, you actually travel. Time goes along. So the Earth is always spinning around. The sun is spinning around and traveling around this. If we're over here during the time of the dinosaurs, the sun was actually probably over here. Looking at a completely different sky on the other side of the galaxy. Now, our spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, and the globular clusters going through it, the Milky Way is part of what's called the local group of galaxies. The local group of galaxies is the Milky Way and a couple of other galaxies that happen to be nearby. I don't know why it zooms in on that one. Milky Way is back here. There we go. Looks a little different because they've added in other stuff, but this is the Milky Way here. And you've got the local group of galaxies. You've got the Magellanic Clouds that you can see in the Southern Hemisphere. Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. All of these galaxies that happen to be in orbit around the Milky Way. Meanwhile, remember Andromeda? She's in here too. This distance between Andromeda and the Milky Way is 2.25 million light years. And closing, the Andromeda Galaxy. This again is the local group of galaxies. Now, there's actually a much larger group called the Virgo Cluster, but I don't think they've actually got a simulation of that in here. So I'm not going to try it. Uh, nonetheless, let's see. Virgo Cluster yet. Nonetheless, there is a simulation of this in about 2 million years or so. The Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy will merge together in a dance something like this. Stars will be thrown out into space. Other stars may merge together or collide. It's not likely because there's a lot of empty space between stars. The core of the galaxy is there and there. They're supermassive black holes. They will try to orbit each other. The spiraling arms. Oh, well, those are all gone. It's a rough life for galaxies. Lots of cannibalism out there. Now, while this is all pretty, very scientific, it's not happening for a very long time, so don't worry about it. Coming back to our nighttime sky... That's kind of an overview of what's going on, what you can find, what you can see when you look around. It's a huge amount of data I didn't get to because we can't go over all of astronomy in just an hour, hour and a half or so. Please share the channel with your friends, family. Uh, we'd like to increase the numbers of viewers, uh, not only of our live streams, but of our pre-recorded stuff that we put over onto YouTube. All of this gets recorded and sent over to YouTube, so if you miss something, you can always click on our YouTube channel, and there you'll find the videos on demand. You'll find the videos on demand as well on Twitch uh, for a shorter period of time, but YouTube are permanent. The big thing I want you to remember is the fact that you are made of stardust, hence why I call all the followers of this channel Stardust. When stars die, they explode violently, or they die quietly. The explosions that are very violent, they seed heavy elements in the universe, in the galaxy itself. And that includes iron. When you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen, and that oxygenates your blood, which has hemoglobin, which acts like it's been oxidized. It turns red. There's iron in your blood. As such, there is stardust in your blood. You and I and all of us, we are all made of stars. Always remember that. It's a very different paraphrase of Carl Sagan's statement, but it's still correct. Have a wonderful day, my starduster friends. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Uh, remember to find us on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook.com. Uh, just look for Earthshine Education, and that's where you'll find us. We try to put some data. Uh, try, we're trying to get back into doing live streams like this, maybe once or twice a day. Depending on when we get the most viewers, that's what we're going to keep. So please click like, share, watch for a little bit. Putting some more pre
pre-made videos up soon. Every month we do a sky update. Still some Astronomy 101 stuff that's just been sitting here that I just didn't like uh, how it was coming out. And now uh, we've got some new new software stuff going on in it. So hopefully we'll be getting it up soon. We hope you have a wonderful day. See you next time.